Before there was a church, before there was a king, before there was a country, there was a family, a home. And God knows how things can work here in this world because God made it. By the way, God knows children better than Dr. Spock does. And Dr. Phil, not that Dr. Phil. God, God knows children, God knows civilization, and the frame and the foundation of civilization better than the best politician in the world, better than the greatest king, the greatest conqueror in the world. God understands how nations rise and fall based upon the condition of the home in that nation. So likewise, as the home and the condition of the home is the foundation of a good society, its destruction then will bring the destruction of that society. The devil didn't just wake up yesterday. He was around from, I want you to consider the Bible and the timing of how God makes things. It wasn't until after God gave the institution of the family that Satan showed up. It's timing. And we're going to learn that today. I think something my dad and my mother instilled in me and Melissa. You like my grammar? My sister and I. What our parents instilled in us was a sense of family bonding. I'll never forget the time my dad and I went to um, a father-son banquet at his church, First Church in DeSoto. And the ladies were getting the meal ready. And there's a, there was a, I can't remember who preached a little sermon there to all of us men. But then uh, Pastor Tebow said, I'm going to give some of you men a chance to testify about something that your daddy taught you. Now, my dad is not me. He is not the public speaker. Okay? So when he stood, it surprised me. Because he don't stand and talk about himself. Me, you can't get me to shut up. But him, no. And he said this and it dawned on me that he had taught me this very same thing without ever saying a word about it. When he married my mom, his daddy, my grandpa, took my dad aside and said, Son, always treat your family like your best friend. If you go, they go with you. If you are staying at home, then after work, you go home after work. Treat them like they're your best friend. And when he said that, I about hit the floor. Because I went back through my history with my dad. And my dad did that. He would be called out away to work. He was a dredging inspector working for the Corps of Engineers. And he would have to go out of town and do contract dredging in different places along rivers. And whenever he went and they paid for him a room to stay in, he got a room big enough. Back then they had kitchenettes. Now they just call them suites. But back then those motels had kitchenettes and he always got a, a room big enough for his family with a kitchen there so that that would be our home. Wherever dad was, that would be our home. The vacations he took us on, the places that he took us, that was my dad doing what my grandpa taught him. And God just instilled that in me through my father. So to my dad, family 
was the most important thing in life. His marriage, his children, how they turned out. And so I want you to think about that and think about the attacks that you may have had on your family at different times in your life. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9. Two are better than one. And again, God did not specify two of this is better than one of this. He leaves it open so that you can then take this thing and apply it everywhere. There is a rule, even in, even in philosophy, in advertising, real estate, science, you name it. It just seems like this whole universe is built upon what they call the rule of three. Which means three rules. Three things are always in charge. Time is past, present, and future. Matter comes in three forms. Solid, liquid, gas. The universe has three dimensions to it. I mean, this is how God made everything here. It's because God is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So that it doesn't surprise me when I see that. So two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth. You listen to your Bible. For he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. Then how can one be warm alone? If one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Now you pray about that and you think about that. And this sermon is for you to apply to yourself alone. It's not up to anybody else to judge you. Judge you. I would not want you judging me. So I'm not going to judge anybody here. And you're not to judge anybody else. But I can tell you that there is always fruit of every situation. And the fruit that exists in this country shows the destruction of the American family. Okay? If you remember in days gone by on TV programming, the hours of 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock were called the family hour. TV networks would not put offensive TV shows on the air during that time because they knew that families, moms and dads and children would be watching these TV. If you go back and watch TV shows from the 60s, 70s, you didn't hear cursing. You didn't have people laying in bed with one another. You didn't, ha you didn't have all that stuff. You had family decent programming. That's changed now, but that's how it used to be. So you think about how quickly life unravels when the devil destroys the home. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, help me to preach or help me to teach this. Lord, I just feel like teaching today. And so, Father, maybe that's just the, just the way things you, this, just the way you want it. Lord, my mind seems to be short of words this morning, so I pray, dear God, that in my weakness, God, you would say what needs to be said to somebody. Let this message and this teaching be an encouragement, a blessing, a reflection, or a warning. And God, that's up to you how you apply it. But Father, give us wisdom, give us insight into what works and what doesn't in our lives. God, we thank you for all the things that you've taught us over the years. And God, help us to continue to be teachable. Because we don't know everything. I don't know everything. But God, I still have a heart that wants to learn. God, I still crave those times when you would show me some wondrous thing in your word. I like those things, God. I need them. And I pray, dear God, that your words today to these people would be a blessing. And that, Father, what's preached today would work, whether it's in America or England or Australia or India or Africa. No matter where it is and where it goes, God, that your word would be a blessing to some people today who need it. We thank you, God, for what we're about to hear. We thank you for the word. 
We love you and we ask, Father, for your help in application of this teaching. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now turn to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. And let's look at this. In, uh, if, you, if you're at Genesis 3, just look a couple of verses before chapter 3 and you'll see God instituting the home and the family. Because He said in verse 22, The rib which the Lord God had taken from man made He a woman and brought her to the man. And why did God do that? We're going to read about it in a little bit. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So the threefold court of civilization, I have it up on the screen, is the husband. And I've told you what that word means, but I'm going to remind you of it here in a little bit. The husband. The wife and children. Now, I, I understand that not every couple can have children. I get that. Okay? But there are exceptions. But this is the rule. This is the rule. When God looked at Adam, his creation, and Adam, you understand, was the pinnacle of everything that God had done. It was the pinnacle of his creation. But he looks at man being alone and he says, it is not good that man should be alone. And that verse there in Ecclesiastes, two are better than one. Um, it's not good that a, a man is alone. He needs that wife. He needs a help meet for him. And to the woman in Genesis 3.16, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. Now, I had always read that verse as, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow in thy conception. But that's not what it says. He says, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow, and I will also greatly multiply thy conception. There are some species that give birth one time, that's it. But God didn't make man that way. But... Ladies, you ought to say thank you because God didn't make you like dogs either. You know, put out 10, 15 puppies at a time. Amen. One at a time, God. But he said he would greatly multiply thy conception. And I still believe that the greatest thing that a woman can do in this world is to bring life into this world. Not kill it. But he said, ladies, in sorrow, thou shalt bring forth children. How true is that? Not only is the birthing part sorrowful, but the raising. And something Lisa and I found out, you're never done raising them. You're never done. Okay? But in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. And look what he said, thy desire shall be to thy husband, he shall rule over thee. And ladies, I, I, I don't want to hear your feminist 21st century garbage. What I'm going to tell you is straight out from the Word of God, and I'm not going to apologize for it. God put it in your heart for your desire to be to your husband. That's where the heart of a woman looks. And it took me a, quite a while to figure that out. You said, why did you have to figure it out? Because, to be honest with you, I, ha I don't know. When I look back, I don't know what my wife saw in me back then. Because there wasn't much there. But then I learned that God had put in my wife's heart a desire to have a husband to look up to. A husband that she could be proud of. The two greatest, the, the, I'll say this, the greatest thing that I've ever heard in my life came from two different people in my life. The greatest thing I ever heard was, I am proud of you. The first time I heard it was at my ordination service and my dad said to me, 
Son, I'm proud of you. The second time I heard it was when my wife looked at me and said, I'm proud of you. I'll never get over that as long as I live. Because it had dawned on me that God had put it in my wife's heart to want to have, she needs somebody to look up to. And men, if you think that the greatest happiness in the world is in chasing down every bottle of beer and every whore in the world, you're wrong. The TV commercials sell it wrong. Beer and whiskey is not the greatest thing to ever come in your life. Chasing to, and, and having a list of all the women you've conquered is not the greatest thing to ever happen to you. Having a wife that looks up to you is. Okay? And then look in Genesis 9. God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, What? Be fruitful and multiply and replenish their... What did, are there three things here in this verse that God said? What did I just tell you? The rule of three. Three things rule. God blessed mankind with fruitfulness, multiplication, and replenishing. It is our gift. It is our gift that God has given us in life. To not only make sure that there's enough people in this world to continue on. But that whatever we take from the earth, we can put it back. If we plant crops and yield things from the earth, God's given us the gift to be able to put back in the earth so we can take it out again. What is it? Give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. Teach a man to fish, and he'll eat for a lifetime. God's given us that gift, and it's a blessing. It's a blessing. After God had wiped off the earth completely, killed every living creature on the earth, and you've got just a boatload of animals and people, God blessed this earth once again by saying, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So that's it right there. The blessings of God are just that simple. Guys, there is no greater feeling in the world than to know that your wife respects you and looks up to you. Nothing greater in life. Now turn to Psalm chapter 2. If you think this is going to be an easy ride, it's not. Because God has put in this world things that want to kill us. Things that want to destroy us. I've been there. You give it time, you'll be there too. So the threefold cord is a father and a mother and children. So let me, let me just ask you a question. Does a man need a family to make his life complete? Yep. Does a woman need a husband and children to make her life complete? I'm thinking of your testimony, what you told me in my office that day. Okay? I'm not going to say it, but I remember what you said. Okay? God puts it in a woman's heart at some point to where she doesn't want what this world is offering. She wants what God has blessed. Do children need a mom and dad? Lisa read to me a story that she saw on Facebook, I guess, or something, where a woman grabbed a sword and went stabbing the man, her boyfriend, who was on top of her daughter. I'm telling you, children need a father, not mom's boyfriend. Okay? Am I wrong? So now look at your Bible. Psalm 2, verse 1. Why did the heathen rage? 
and the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Let me ask you a question. Are there rulers in America who hate God? Every politician who either votes for or does not vote against abortion is a killer. Okay? When you stand and do nothing, now you may not win the vote, but at least you made it known where you stand. They will take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed and whatever God sees as being right. And it says, verse 3, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their what? The cords. Let's cut the threefold cord of the family. Because I, I want to say this to you. I want to get political for a minute. You know what a lot of politicians realize? That when children don't have a family to take care of them, they will turn to government. And there's a lot of politicians out there that are just power hungry enough to deliberately want the American family destroyed so that these people will need government. Why do you think politicians are in favor of bringing in illegal people into this nation? They're trying to destroy the, the cords that make America strong so that then they get the power. I'm telling you, that's how it is. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in heaven shall laugh and the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And then look at what God is saying. God not only sees that this is beneficial for man, the very nature of God is that he has a son. So well, who's his mother? Jerusalem, which is above, which is free, is the mother of us all, the Bible said. Now, I don't understand that, and I'm not sure that that's exactly how it works. But I'm just saying that's, that's how God, God didn't put anything down here that he doesn't already have going up in heaven. But they will try to destroy your family. And for no other reason than it's a family and it's God's way. And the devil understands this. The devil understands that the greatest blessing among mankind and the greatest liberties will come when the, the family orientation that God has instituted in this world, when those things are being practiced and honored, God will bless that nation. Righteousness, the Bible says, exalteth a nation. Okay? But sin is a plague. And any time that the family unit is being, try, is being trying to be dissolved or broken up or cast that cord, cut that cord and cast it from us, any time where that's taking place, it's because they know that if a well-rounded family will not have very much need of government imposition in their life. I mean, they release studies to us all the time that tell us that, um, you know, it, it has been determined that children who grow up in broken homes are, you know, five times more likely to get into drugs, five times more likely to end up in prison, five times more likely to do this and more likely to do that. Well, duh. It's because God knows that where the family unit is allowed to thrive, those children won't go out breaking laws. They will, for the most part, grow up and become at least what their parents taught them, if not better. But any place where there is attacks on the family unit, you're going to see broken homes, you're going to see sin run rampant. Now, Hosea 11, I like this. Turn there, I want you to see this in your Bible. Hosea 11, 4. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Now, I'm just telling you, back up in Minnesota, they let me preach two and a half hours straight. Huh? Hey, this day's the Lord's. This ain't your day. 
Tomorrow's your day. Look in your Bible. Hosea 11, 4. I drew them with cords of a man and with bands of love. 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 Husbands, love your wives. Love them. Unconditional love. Love your wives. Because if you don't, she'll find somebody else that will. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, love your husbands. And love your children. Moms and dads, love your children. Love them. And when you love them, you'll correct them. Is that right? Is that how the Bible lays it out? You bet it is. When you love them, you'll correct them. Okay? And I always like to throw this in when I mention biblical correction. Yelling is not correction. Okay? A rod is. But cursing children is not correcting them. It's not. So, what should be in place in every family is a husband who loves his wife. Because if he loves his wife, he'll think twice and three times and four times and five times before stepping out on her. A wife who loves her husband. Because if she loves her husband, she'll reverence her husband. She will be God's role model in that husband. She'll be the help that God calls her to be in that marriage. Now, something that God had to show me years ago. I'm not teaching you anything that God has not had to break over my head before. And one of those things was about the role of my wife in my life and my ministry. No, Lisa does not write the sermons. Lisa does not even tell me what I ought to be preaching. Except for that first time I heard Reg. And then she said, how come you don't preach like that? I was mad at her. But she does not sit and dictate to me how I have to write the sermons, what I ought to be saying. She does not get the script for prior, prior approval before they come out. Okay? But God taught me the blessing of listening to a different opinion. My wife does not see the world the way I see it. In some cases, she's wrong. But in some cases, I'm wrong. And God really laid this on my heart one day. Was, Mike, listen to your wife. I would listen to anybody in this church. But I was not listening to my wife and she knew it. And see, remember, what God put in her heart, I was not providing her. I was not giving her somebody that would listen to her. And I want to throw this in too. Listening does not mean arguing to try to show her how wrong she is. So we made a deal, or I made a deal with her. I told her, I said, I promise you from here on out, I will do everything in my power that what you say to me, I'll listen to you. If I don't say anything back, it may be that I don't agree with you. But what I'll do is I'll take what you said and I'll go ask God. And if God says it's right, then I'll listen to it. But if God says, Mike, where in the world did she get that from? Then I'll, I'll know to trust God. But see then... It's not me constantly trying to convince her of how wrong she is on everything. See, that's, you don't have a godly marriage. You don't have what's right in God's eyes. You see, the children then 
are supposed to look to that for their example. Did you ever see your mom and dad fighting? Did you ever see your mom and dad this? Did you ever see your mom and dad that? No. That's how you're supposed to be. So the family can only be held together by genuine love. Now if it's fake love where, oh honey, I love you, and you're only saying that because you're wanting what you're going to get out of it, that's not true love. Because after a while, everybody knows, after a while, that runs dry. And if that's all the relationship was based upon, it's not going to last. So it takes real, genuine love. If the man will love his wife that way, God will bless him. If the man will love his children that way. Guys here, guys online, would you listen to me? Loving your family, yes, go out and work hard for them, but come home. These beer halls do not need you near as much as your family does. And I met a man, I used to work with a guy whose wife, she finally had it. Because he would get off work and go right to the pool hall and stay there till 1 o'clock. And he did this every day. Then have to get up at 5 the next morning and go to work. And he used to come in all blurry eyed. And finally he'd come crying to me. He said his wife threw him out. I said, really? Imagine that. I mean, I wasn't mean to him. He said, do you think she'll take me back? I don't know. She may have had enough of that. Because you did this before, didn't you? Yeah. Did you promise her you'd straighten up? Yeah. Did you do it? No. So I said, if I were you, I would pray and I would get God in my life. And then I would pray that God would restore my marriage. And then maybe God would change your heart toward you. So a week later, he came to me and he said, I found a better solution than that. He found a woman at the pool hall. So now some other man is raising his children. So guys, if you love your family and you love your children, you'd be home for them. And not running around all over God's creation. So I drew them, and wives, same thing. Wives, love your husbands. Love those children. And those children, they, they you know, that I know teenagers, they get to a point, they don't listen. But I promise you, when they're adults, they'll know where home was. They'll know who their real friends were. It was their mom and dad all along. Because mom and dad didn't just say, I love you. They showed it. And they proved it. Now, I know I'm not going to be able to keep you very long, but turn back to Genesis chapter 2. So... There's a lot here that I want to give you. I, I know that I do this. I always build way too much into the sermon than I, what I can preach in one sermon. As well intentioned as I am. Genesis chapter 2. This is, what, this is that threefold chord. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make an help meet for him. My wife is my helper, my friend, my confidant, not my enemy. She's there for my benefit. This is why, and I had to learn this, God would not allow a man to be a bishop over a church except for what was the first qualifying condition? Husband and one wife. And Brady and Bradley and I were talking about this. I never thought about this. But they had the idea, and I, I'm not sure that they're wrong. They had the idea that they were not allowed to be a bishop until after they were married. Because it said, let him be the husband of one wife. And I went, that's not bad. Because it's hard for a man to do it alone. And the temptations that are out there are just too strong to overcome if you're all alone. Amen? So 
So it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make an help meet for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a, a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. There shall, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. See, there's the family right there. The man, his father and his mother... God blesses him. God blessed them with reproduction. And now God's going to bless the reproduction with reproduction. There shall a man cleave unto his wife. And in that case, the word means inseparable. Inseparable. Now, I haven't said something like this in a long time, but I'm going to say it. I understand that in today's world, much of, or many marriages, I'm not sure most marriages, but many marriages have already been hit by divorce. I get it. God does too. God is the one who is able to make all things new. You have an example of the woman at the well that met Jesus. And when the issue of her husband came up, Jesus said, I know, you've already had five husbands. The man you're with now is not your husband. Now, Jesus did not tell her, go back to the first husband, because that's the only thing that's right. He did not tell her that. But what Jesus was interested in at that time was making that woman's life brand new. So, you've had a divorce. Don't make the same mistakes. Make brand new ones, but don't make the same ones. If God gave you the second start, take very care how you do this one. And if it's not built God's way, it will not last either. It will not last, it will not work. And you have to, you have to think of those children. Do you not understand the devil wants your kids? Bad. He wants them bad. You see that when Pharaoh wanted to slaughter all the children? I think it's because the devil knew the potential in at least one of them. That with Moses. When Herod wanted killed all the children two years old and younger, it's because he heard of the potential of one child. And then we see Satan sitting before the woman in Revelation 12, ready to devour her child as soon as it's born. Why? Because he knows what that child's going to do. You don't know what your children, what, how God's going to use your children. But I can tell you that the greater the threat against your children, probably the greater that God's going to work with them and do something with them in their life. My mom could come here and tell you stories that even probably sister and I don't know of how the God tried, how, how the, de the God, the devil, the God of this world tried to destroy my mom and my dad's life while sis and I were little just to make sure that I never showed up in a pulpit. And you don't have to be a preacher for that to happen. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you with this today. I'm going to let you go. But consider your home. Pay attention to your home. Pay attention to your family. And let us... See, we're fixing to sin... Madeline and Cameron off into a world that they know absolutely nothing about. Right? I mean, you two do love each other, right? Hang on to it. Because you'll need that to pay the bills. Okay? <laughs> but they don't know really what they're getting into. But once they run into it, God bless them if they are able to see in the families in this church 
how God brought us through their soon-to-be problems. You see what I'm saying? Let every, not just, not just Ed and Jennifer and Chris and Jared, but every family and married couple in this church, an example to them as they start their new life. Because hopefully, there'll be some children coming a couple years down the road. And I hope you get a big load of them. <laughs> Amen, Jennifer! I'm, listen, I'm telling you, the grandkids are it. Skip the kids, go right to the grandkids, I say. <laughs> Amen! But hopefully, they'll be able to learn the lessons that every one of us has learned in order to get through what they're about to face. Because I could sit them down and take them through scenarios of what could happen and teach them that. But it's best that they learn it from us who've actually lived through it. Can I get an amen? amen? So I want you to consider your roles. Husbands, I want you to consider your role. Ladies, consider how God wants you. Children. Young people, you got your whole life ahead of you. And there are already children your age, JR, who have ruined the whole rest of their life by stuff they got into already. They don't have anything to look forward to except for prison because they've already ruined their life. Threefold cord was broken and it should have never been that way. Let's go to the Lord in prayer uh, tonight. Um, I think God's laid on my heart. We're going to start a, a study of the book of Genesis. I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be good. Uh, but Genesis is the foundation for everything. Okay? So come be with us tonight. Four o'clock. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And I'm going to give you just a minute or two between you and God to ask God about your marriage. Not what your opinion of it is, but what God's opinion of it is. God made it with me to where my family was everything. And there's been more than plenty of times when the devil has wanted to take it all away. And I'm glad that God didn't allow him to. I'm glad. 